Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, welcome back. Um, in this lecture, we're going to uh, discuss this concept of a wave packet. So we're going to take advantage of the uh, mathematics that we've done in the previous lectures, and we're going to apply that to a specific case. And um, in the process, we're going to uh, learn something about uh, uncertainties in position and momentum of these wave functions that, uh, that are now localized. So um, to begin with, I'd, I'd like to just mention that uh, in this lecture, I'm assuming that you're somewhat familiar with the standard uh, form for the Gaussian distribution function. Um, so this first slide is kind of a review of, that, uh, of the standard, standard way of writing this Gaussian distribution. Um, so the, I, I, I just write down here the Gaussian distribution for um, uh, in, in real space, x space, and also in e the equivalent expression uh, for the distribution in k space. Uh, these, uh, these functions uh, describe this, this well-known bell-shaped curve, right? So, uh, and there are two parameters, basically, that, um, that you have to uh, keep track of, right? These two parameters are the, the mean position or the center of this curve, and then also the, the width of the curve is designated by this parameter sigma sub x. So once you specify those two parameters, then uh, the location of this curve along the x-axis and the width of the curve along the x-axis is completely specified. The, uh, the function out in front, the, or the multiplicative factor out in front just ensures that the integral of p of x dx over all x is equal to unity. So this is a normalization factor. And of course, there's an equivalent expression in, uh, in, uh, for, for wave vectors, p sub k, right? So this describes a, a mean wave vector k bar, and then there's also a, a width of, of, of uh, wave vectors uh, associated with this mean value k bar, and that width is specified by this parameter sigma sub k. So to appreciate this lecture, you've got to understand this, this, uh, these, these basic standard uh, equations, and then we're going to be comparing results that we derive uh, to, um, uh, to these standard equations to, to get out information that, that's, that tends to be useful. So what is the purpose of this lecture? Well, uh, what we're going to show is that if a particle, which is represented as a wave, has an uncertainty in position, so that means it's, it's localized to some region in space, uh, then there must be a corresponding uncertainty in the momentum of that particle. So the idea is there's a correlation uh, between uncertainty in position and uncertainty in momentum. And this correlation is, is uh, fundamental. It's just built into the math. You can't get around it. And it just basically means that when you localize a particle, uh, you have a very difficult time uh, measuring uh, its momentum with high precision. So there's an uncertainty in a position and an uncertainty in a momentum, and the uncertainties in positions and momentums have to satisfy what is known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so that, that will evolve as, as the lecture uh, progresses. So, if you recall, uh, the, the motivation for this, uh, this desire to write a, a wave packet, which describes a localized particle, the motivation comes from the realization that this free particle wave function uh, describes a particle that's completely delocalized in space. And that's somewhat artificial. It's a, it's, it's a construct. Um, it's a very useful construct. You can learn an awful lot. But uh, there's this desire to do a better job. And the way we're going to do a better job is we're going to um, uh, write a wave function psi of x that is now localized in a region of space. And the way we're going to do that is by specifying another function phi of k, which when multiplied by the different uh, uh, free particle wave functions, e to the i k x, and integrated over all k, uh, give rise to a, a localized wave function psi of x. 
And then the question becomes, well, how do you determine these, these coefficients phi of k that multiply uh, the free electron um, uh, component of this wave function? So that free electron component of the wave function is that e to the i k x. How do you determine the phi of k? Well, you make use of the Fourier integral that we discussed in the previous lecture. Right, so if I know psi of x, I can determine phi of k uniquely. So, let's think about ways to write down uh, psi of x that uh, produces a localized wave in, uh, in, in space. And uh, the, the way this is normally done is, uh, is indicated in this particular uh, equation. Um, and you'll, you'll immediately, hope, hopefully you'll immediately recognize what this equation is trying to accomplish. It has three terms in it. The first term is a normalization term, okay, and, and that's going to assure that the, the, that the probability density, psi star psi, when integrated over all space is equal to unity. So this is a normalization factor that's already been worked out. The second term in this equation is the uh, uh, free particle wave function at some wave vector k0. So this is the e to the i k0 x term. And so this gives rise to this oscillatory uh, uh, feature in the wave function. And the, to localize that oscillatory behavior to a small region in space, we then invoke this envelope function, which is a uh, 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 basically comes from the Gaussian distribution that we talked about earlier in this lecture. It's an e to the minus x squared function. That's symmetric, uh, about x equals zero, and it, it just provides this envelope for the free particle wave function. So these three components are, are um, um, uh, involved in writing down a, a wave packet. So this this, this thing here is referred to as a wave packet. Uh, this particular wave packet happens to be localized at a point x equal to zero. And um, what we're interested in, for instance, is how this wave packet, which is now going to describe a localized particle, how that's going to, uh, to move in time and interact with its environment. So once you uh, buy into this expression for the wave function, then the rest of the uh, lecture is just pure mathematics. It's uh, er everything follows logically from 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 this definition of the wave function. So it's kind of important for you to understand what this wave function is trying to accomplish, uh, and uh, appreciate that that if you actually uh, plotted the wave function, uh, you would get uh, something that looked like this, right? So you also have to appreciate that this red curve is going to have both real and imaginary components. In this schematic diagram, I've just uh, uh, just drawn a, an oscillatory wave, not worrying so much about whether I'm plotting the real or the imaginary part. But in principle, it does have a real part and an imaginary part associated with it. So the important consequences of this um, wave function is that if this is the wave function we choose to write, uh, uh, then the probability density associated with that wave function is going to have this Gaussian probability distribution factor, e to the minus x squared over 2 alpha. Okay, So uh, this just simply follows because when I take psi psi star, the free, uh, free electron, the free particle part of the wave function drops out. right, And I'm left with just the... Um, uh, uh, square the normalization constant, and then I have to uh, square the, uh, the uh, Gaussian function to get this e to the minus x squared over 2 alpha. If you compare the form of psi star psi to the probability distribution function that we wrote down on the uh, uh, first slide of this lecture, right, you'll find that this component sigma sub x, which describes the width of the probability distribution function, that, that, uh, that parameter sigma x can be um, associated with the square root of this parameter alpha that appears in the wave function. And furthermore, you can see that uh, this, this form of the, the probability density uh, 
basically gives you a value of x bar equal to zero, which means the, the, uh, the uh, center position of this particle is centered at zero. And so that just simply means that if you plotted this wave function, or if you plotted the probability density of this wave function, you would get this Gaussian shaped curve. Um, it would be centered at x equal to zero, and it would have a, a characteristic width that would be uh, twice this, this square root of alpha parameter. Okay? So, uh, those are important consequences of the, of the wave function. Uh, what we now like to do is we like to calculate the Fourier transform pair. In other words, we like to calculate this phi of k. And to do that, uh, it's just a formal exercise. Uh, you have to substitute into this definition of phi of k, the wave function psi of x, and I've done that, that here, and then you have to perform that integral. So we'll work that integral out in the next lecture. I'm just going to basically state the answer here, uh, just to uh, uh, emphasize the final result of this discussion. So it turns out when you evaluate this integral, you'll end up with a wave function that looks like this. Uh, this wave function also has this uh, quadratic uh, uh, exponential envelope function. And um, when we take uh, phi star phi, right, and, uh, and write it out and compare it to the probability distribution function that we wrote down in the first slide, right, we can we can make a one-to-one -one identification of the parameter sigma sub k, which characterizes the, the spread in k space of the wave vectors that are required in order to uh, uh, write down this wave function psi of x, right? So that parameter sigma sub k, in this case, happens to be one, one over two times the square root of alpha. It's just simple algebra to get that result. And the other thing that you can see is that uh, the, the, the wave vector, uh, the, the k vectors are centered at an average value k bar, which is given by this parameter k0 that comes out of um, uh, uh, the Fourier transform of psi of x. So k0 was the component, uh, the free particle uh, component of the wave vector uh, up here. So that k0 comes down and, and it becomes the average k value for the waves that comprise this wave function psi of x. So the moral of this story, I mean, what are we doing here is, right, this is, tends to be just pure mathematics. Moral of the story is that if we take the product of the, um, the uh, width of the curve in, uh, in real space x times the, uh, the width of the curve in k space sigma sub k, Right, and we identify these values of sigma in terms of the uncertainty of the position in X and the uncertainty of the, uh, the wave vectors K that comprise the wave function. And then we, can, we convert K into a momentum by just simply multiplying by H bar. We end up with an expression based on these, these uh, values for sigma X and sigma K. We end up with an expression that says, delta x over delta p divided by h bar is equal to one half, right? And it just follows strictly from this, from this line of arithmetic. And this is often written in a, in a more familiar form that says the uncertainty in the uh, position x times the uncertainty in the momentum p uh, is equal to just h bar over 2. And this is, this is formally known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So for these Gaussian shape wave packets, this is an identity for any other wave packet that you can imagine writing down. This identity gets, written, uh, gets converted into an inequality in it, and the inequality then says delta x delta p has got to be greater than h bar over 2. The minimum value delta x and delta p can have is h bar over 2, and that that is the a special result for these Gaussian wave packets that, that we're discussing here. So this is the important result of the uh, of the of this lecture, right? That that you you see how this equation is derived. Um, the next lecture will actually work through some of the arithmetic and, and show you how that comes out. Um, 
What I like to do is I like to uh, provide some intuition um, about what actually is going on. And, and to do that, I'm going to rely on these computer simulations that are available on the web. Uh, so I go to this website uh, down here, which is very, very useful website for understanding this relationship between um, uh, components in K-space and the actual waves that uh, result in, in real space uh, X. And what I like about the website is it, it allow, there's a control panel here that basically allows you to specify the components of the wave in K-space. It then plots out each component in real space here, and it shows you how when you add up all those components, this is the net result that you get. So for the for our application, this is uh, this this down here could be re re referred to as psi of x. This plot up here could be re referred to as phi of k. And so for this distribution of phi's, uh, or, or for this uh, for for a phi that's comprised of of a finite number of k values, you end up with a wave function psi that has this repetitive periodic uh, pulse-like uh, uh, form, right? And you can control, right? The great thing about this website is you can control the spacing between these K vectors, uh, these different components in K space, just by moving this slider back and forth. So right now I've got the slider set so that the spacing between the, the K values is given by uh, the, the length of this, um, this uh, measurement bar here, right? And when, 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 I, when I have this measurement bar set to its maximum value, you can see what happens. You can see that you basically have a periodic set of pulses. This is something that we also talked about earlier in the week. This should not be a surprise to you, right? What this website allows you to do is, though, it allows you to set the spread in K so that, that's measuring the width of this distribution of k vectors, right? It allows you to set that, and it also allows you to set the width of the, uh, the pulse in x space, right, with this slider. So these two things can be adjusted. For the simulations that I'm going to show you, I leave these two buttons the same, and what I'm adjusting is I'm adjusting the, the number of k values that are, are required to produce a given waveform. So if I um, if I move this slider down one notch, uh, right, what will happen is the the components in K will become more closely spaced, and so I show you that here, right. So now I've got more values of K, right. These additional values of K require you to go a further distance in X before the various waves uh, sync up again and add up in phase. And the resulting wave function that results is now a wave function that is a little bit more localized in space than the previous uh, wave function, uh, simply because these pulses are now separated by a greater distance. If I uh, move this slider one click further down, right, I start to pick up many more components of the wave vector uh, in, in phi of k. So now the separation between uh, uh, k components is indicated by the the, uh, the two arrows up here. Uh, you can see that the uh, uh, waves are synchronized at x equal to zero. Uh, you need a lot of waves, a lot of different wave components to produce a net result of zero. And this particular wave has another pulse. It's not located. It's not not visible in the in the region of X that's plotted here, right? So there's another pulse, but it's off the screen. Uh, the point is that if you add more values of K, uh, these pulses become further apart. And in the limit, when when uh, K is continuous, so now I've now I've set the spacing between K values equal to zero. In that limit, I end up with just a single pulse located uh, at the origin. Right, and this is the wave packet that, that we've been discussing in this particular lecture, right? And this particular wave packet is comprised of a phi of k, which is continuous in k. And 
the, the point that I, I want, want to remember, want you to remember from this exercise is that, that, that we can go back and we can measure the width in K and we can also measure the width in X of these, uh, these different wave functions. And um, if you do that measurement systematically, uh, it just proves out this, this, uh, this idea that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh, uh, pointed out, right? It's basically saying that if you take the width in K space and multiply it by the width in real space, right, you end up with a constant value. And that just simply means that you cannot adjust sigma X uh, without having to adjust sigma K accordingly. These two guys are coupled because they're equal. In this particular example, they're equal to a, a constant, which is, which is one radian. Uh, if you uh, increase the width of the distribution in K space, you correspondingly make the, the wave function in real space more localized, but the same, uh, same thing applies, the same idea applies. If you measure the width in K space, you measure the width of your wave function in real space, right? you multiply those two guys together, you get a constant value, which again just emphasizes that, uh, that, that, that this and this are tied together in a very uh, fundamental and, and uh, close way. So that's the thing that you have to remember from this lecture. And uh, what I'll do in the next lecture is, uh, if, if you don't like the arithmetic that we're using with this Fourier transform integrals, I'll uh, describe a much simpler uh, viewpoint. It's not as rigorous, uh, but it basically uh, comes to the same conclusion. And uh, then we'll uh, do a few examples in the next lecture to show you how to use Heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh, to, uh, to answer some questions that are of fundamental interest. So we'll see you for, uh, for that lecture uh, whenever you get a chance to look at it.